Call the uh, April 27th meeting of the Peters Township Council to order. Mr. Lauer, the roll call. Mrs. Merrill. Present. Mr. Steigel. Present. Mr. Curry. Here. Mr. Ball. Present. Mr. Berquist. Here. Mr. Kozer. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Right. Rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first item, approval of the minutes from the council meeting of April 13th. So moved. Second. Discussion? Um, I had a recommendation, Mr. Chairman, um, because the system is different and we are not taking or inviting live audience members and we are taking comments. I was suggesting that so that we can recognize the standards for Sunshine Law that we should add something that says more clarification than under audience comments. Residents were at, invited to submit comments or questions in advance and state that there were none for last meeting, just so that we can show that we did follow what the intent was. Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, special reports. Um, I had to ask Chief <clears throat> McLaughlin to come tonight and um, I, I think to, to a large extent, we're, uh, I'm not sure that we have a lot more to report to council. Um, we did want to take some questions. There were a couple of things, though, that I did want to share with you. Uh, one of the things that you have is this report from the Allegheny <coughs> County Department of Emergency Services. And when you look at what information is coming out of the region, still the Allegheny County Health Department and the Allegheny County Department of Emergency Services is certainly providing uh, very important information for the region. On the back of the pages that I Xeroxed for you is this chart. And what is important about this chart is it relates to the criteria that the governor established for um, uh, moving uh, to have businesses open. So um, what the governor had said was to move from the condition that we're in right now, this red phase to the yellow phase, uh, required that uh, there be uh, 50 or less new positive COVID cases per 100,000 in the previous 14 days in the region. And the important thing is when you look at this chart, what you, you see is the number of cases, the daily average, the target numbers, and the, and the, the uh, target da daily average. And for the region as a whole, we are there. Um, the only county that you see that has not met those targets right now are Beaver County, and there are some uh, tragic situations occurring in Beaver County with regard to nursing homes. So if this persists, and I would think, uh, given what we <coughs> see, I would think that it would, it tells me that on May 8th, um, the next time the governor intends to look at this, it would not surprise me that we would see um, some move towards beginning to open up certain businesses. Now, what that means, I don't think anybody knows at this point, uh, but I do find this, this to be encouraging. Um, the stay-at-home order has been modified to allow construction activities to start on, on May 1st. So, um, that is not only building construction, but that's earth moving activity. So we would anticipate that uh, projects that have been on hold over the last month will be back up and running. In, during the, this period, we have processed over 30 building permits and we're gonna begin issuing th those this week so that on May 1st, the builders are in a position they can start construction on those. Um, we have, we have, have the building inspectors working on a modified schedule right now. Um, uh, they will return to a normal schedule when the when the need for their services uh, by the building community uh, warrants it. Um, up to the over the last 30 days, we have suspended uh, issuing property maintenance violations. That doesn't mean we haven't been out investigating them. Um, it's going to be my direction to uh, Mr. Zook that uh, commencing tomorrow that uh, a number of these which are ready to be processed that we. Uh, begin to serve notice so that, in fact, people uh, correct, can correct those, those violations. 
Um, nothing uh, has changed with regard to our status as of this point, so therefore uh, staffing levels have, have remained the same, and I don't uh, anticipate staffing levels changing before May 8th. One thing that I think is of note when you look at the governor's plan, um, it would appear that libraries and recreation centers will only be reopened when we reach that green phase. I don't know when that's going to occur, um, when you look at what's needed for that to happen. So I would not anticipate that the library or the rec center opening up soon. Having said that, what we are beginning to do um, with Mrs. Olenek and Ms. Harmel, uh, as well as what we're doing in this uh, our building here, is beginning to examine those buildings and structures to see what modifications will make sense to have in place so that as soon as they can open, we in fact can open them. So um, we're gonna, uh, we've been looking at the municipal building over the last week, we're gonna begin to look at the, those other two facilities um, this week. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, I, it's gonna be my advice uh, to, to the advisory boards, um, with the exception of the Planning Commission and the Zoning Hearing Board, that they reinstate meeting and we do those uh, as virtual meetings. There's no reason for, for, those, for the bulk of those boards to have to meet in person, and I think that would make sense. The Planning Commission and the Zoning Hearing Board, on the other hand, I don't know how they can deliberate on issues involving review of plans and things like that without setting, sitting together. And so um, the, the, neither the Zoning Hearing Board or the Planning Commission have anything on their agenda that, that requires them to meet in the month of May, um, but come June they will. And, um, I think what we're going to suggest is that they meet similar to the way council is meeting here right now. The one thing that I, you know, in terms of this meeting and how we meet and, and, and what's the proper decorum for it, that's really for council to decide. And, and um, we can meet this way, you can meet virtually. I can tell you, I think one of the things that gets to be a challenge is that so much of what we look at in terms of council involves examining plans and, and things like that and, and doing that on a virtual basis, I don't know how that, that would work out because you're going to end up with a building drawings that are like this big in the size of your, your computer screen. But that's up to you and, and, and what it is we need to do to me is up to you as well. But, um, and I, you know, I'm prepared to accommodate whatever council wants to do. So. I've been on a couple of Zoom meetings and there's always technical difficulties. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what we're doing right now is fine. If nobody has any objection to it, it's a, okay. I've been on about a hundred Zoom meetings lately, and believe me, this is the way to do it. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree. I don't know. Mike, if you just a quick couple rundowns since the last time we met. Um, I distributed to all the council members the zip code map that the state is now uh, publishing. Um, with that, since I've sent that out a week ago today, um, the 15317 and 15367 zip codes have seen no increase in cases. Uh, 15317 stays at 22, 15367 stays at six. Um, we have seen an increase in the Washington zip code, however, uh, that's still two zip codes away from us. But um, since meeting last, we received two batches of supplies from Washington County, one on the 16th, one on the 21st. Uh, we picked up for both uh, police and fire. And one of the challenges that we've seen is, is the county distributing um, to agencies and not municipality. So they're distributing supplies to police, fire, and EMS separately. Um, the good news is, is they are distributing supplies. Um, and, and this challenge has not kept Peters Township from getting supplies whatsoever. Um, we've adjusted to it. They've been working with us very closely and, and have helped us immensely uh, over the last couple weeks. So their cooperation is appreciated as well. One of the things we continue to see are just the, the so many resourceful community members that we have here in Peters Township. Um, we have a, a community member that serves on the board for uh, personal protective equipment distribution in Allegheny County that says, hey, I live in Peters Township. We're making plastic masks. Can we be of help to you? And these are the plastic shields that will go over responders N95s, and we're able to procure at least 20 of those, those masks this week. 
Um, Mr. Lauer talked about the, the Governor Wolf response. Uh, we did have a responder that exhibited symptoms this last week. Um, that responder had a, a fever and uh, some fatigue. He talked to his primary care physician and being a first responder uh, was able to, to procure a test. He did test negative and has returned to work. We have officially launched the Neighbors Helping Neighbors program in conjunction with Meals on Wheels at the Crossroads and the McMurray Rotary. Um, it's off to a good start. It seems to be getting some decent participation. And our PPE stock is now what I would consider within the comfortable levels. So back stock of suppliers has now come to a point where they're starting to fulfill back orders and we're getting that slow trickle in of equipment. Does council have any questions? Do you, you have temperature gauges at at the fire station and police station, we do have temperature gauges. It's, the, it's Mr. Lauer's plan to order some, especially as employees start to come back to work, right. um, to, to take their temperature and to screen them. But at the police station and fire station, we have a pretty rigorous screening process before any employee comes to work. I would just note, too, that anybody that's tracking uh, zip code data, that 15317 zip code doesn't imply Peters Township. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. Cannonsburg, parts of North Sturbane, Cecil right. Township. It's a very, very large area. It's a huge, zip code huge area. Because I've had people tell me, you know, gee, I didn't realize we had that many cases in Peters Township. You know, you really don't. And we don't, exactly. <laughs> and, and with my email to council was when I go back and look at it, how many zip codes actually encompass Peters Township has within it. Right. Um, you know, five separate zip codes. Too, right. So. And it's and the other thing is that anybody that is interested in the minutia of data, um, there there's a uh, website. The uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health has a really good um, website where you can get into all kinds of data. I, I sent it to you this morning. It, it, and it, it, it's really interesting to look at that data and the data that comes and how they break it down even to nursing facilities and care right. facilities where these cases are originating from or, or unfortunately yeah. where, where they stop in some cases. Yeah, so if any, it, it's just, you go on, you, Pennsylvania Department of Health, uh, COVID, and that'll get you pretty much into the website. Some encouraging numbers from, from the Allegheny County Emergency Services Report too are the uh, percentage of ventilators in use within the state and within the county, uh, both of which are under 30%, still right. right around that 30% number. So that, that's encouraging statewide. Yeah, there was a, another statistic on there that, that showed the percentage of uh, ventilators that are out of service, you know, you know basically sitting on a, sh a shelf, so it's it a lot of them. Chief Mike, I, I wanted to ask a question or two. So Mr. Lauer alluded to the potential opening of the state, and our region seems to be doing okay, so there's potential there. But a lot of the talk now is about a possible relapse or a second wave that might come back in in the fall. Not to be alarmist, but I guess one of the things I would like to know is, I think we need to, are you planning for that? Are you looking ahead so that if in fact something like that happens, you know, the PPEs you have now, you're comfortable, you use the term, what about the future? And Perhaps that's something you don't have to respond to now, but is that going to be the next phase of your planning? Yes, very much so. So we have short-term and long-term goals within our, our personal protective equipment. When I say we're comfortable with our PPE supply now, that, that's for the short term. Now, what we have been doing is conserving its use. So if you'll notice the mask I'm wearing today was the same mask I was wearing two weeks ago. Uh, we're able to reuse N95 style masks if they're stored properly and put away in our department. The police department has been doing so as well in order to conserve these supplies. If we continue to do that, we will survive the long term for personal protective equipment. Um, we have been able to get gowns and masks and, and certain things, again, through our regular procurement process that has been delayed because of back orders. And we're still placing those orders for, for future occurrences, whether it be August, September, October, November, or even into 2021. Uh, I think we need to keep a larger, not a large supply, but an adequate supply of PPE on hand to be able to forecast these things in the future. Thank you. Um, one other thing, um, I appreciate that you mentioned the, the gentleman, the resident who's helping with the masks and the straps and all that. And interestingly, we have a resident here in the township who works with the Allegheny County Medical Society who has made an offer that perhaps if we're interested, one of the physicians might be willing to come and have a conversation with us about 
further implications and things like that. So perhaps you can talk about that a little bit. It's interesting that people who live in Peter's Township are really it. And, and sometimes it takes an emergency to see that, and other times it's just in passing. But uh, my, my inbox for email has been inundated with, hey, we want to help. How can we help? And mm -hmm. any little thing from something that ties a surgical mask so it doesn't have to go around your ears, there's a strap that goes around your head. Um, some high profile, humble people in this community, I'm proud to be one of them, and, and not high profile though, but uh, humble with that. And, and it, it's nice to see it's reassuring and it's kind of that feel good feeling you have out of the community through this response. I'd also like to recognize the, the uh, Neighbors Healthy Neighbors, it sounds like a good program. Any little way we can help, um, like we've seen in, in many other departments, our, our responses have not dropped significantly, but as you'll see from our, our monthly report, the non-emergency numbers have dropped, and it's simply because these are in-person inspections. So the way we've always driven our department has, has been based upon services, and we offer a ton of services. We're doing car seat inspections virtually now. Um, we're, we're trying to adapt as many ways as we can. We're going to post a video for fire prevention and doing smoke uh, fire drills in your homes for all the kids that, that would be in school. They're going to do them in homes. So it, it's taken us adapting as well. So little by little, things we can do to help, we're going to do them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I had uh, expressed to council is that we would, on a rolling basis, look at events coming up. And so we're looking at the events that are scheduled for June. Uh, there's a movie in a the park, there's the Tennis Fun Day, and there's a concert in the park uh, that was to feature the Washington uh, Symphony Orchestra. As of right now, I don't know how we could do any of those, those events. I know the, the uh, Washington Symphony Orchestra is looking for direction from us because they would like to be able to, to know whether or not that event's occurring so that they can prepare accordingly. So. If nothing really changes, I think these three events are going to probably end up having to be canceled. Um, I think what we're going to do is uh, we have shelter rentals that people have. We're going to hold on to those shelter rentals to, to as long as we can before we find out whether or not we're going to be able to accommodate those. So, and that's all I have. Well, cancel, but can't we do singing in the rain and another night? That's one of the movies. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think that's what that Great is. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. I think that it, I think these kind of activities could easily be moved, but I'm not clear about is whether anything's going to change between now and the the uh, middle of summer. But we'll see. Do you, do you make that decision, or is that our decision? It's always your decision. Well, I'm going to make a motion that uh, you can cancel and move or remove or whatever you need to do with any of that stuff without council's approval in your discretion. That, that would be fine. I'll second. Okay, move and second. Is there any other discussion on that? In well, favor? Aye. Uh, Oski, you had something to say, Monica? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's hard to, um, I, I appreciate that. And I guess all I would like to know in advance of what your plan is before you go ahead so that if we had a contrary opinion, we mm -hmm. could potentially voice it. Um, you know, people are looking for ways to, to get out and about it. And I think if, if working with Chief Mike as the emergency preparedness person, you could figure out a way to do it safely, that might be one thing. So if you could just give us advance notice before you send out an email blast. Sure. Thank you. I don't need any notice. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. In favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. Um, as mentioned earlier in the meeting, audience comments, uh, because of the situation with COVID, we do not have live audience. However, any member of the community that uh, would like to bring an, you know, something to our attention is perfectly welcome to email uh, or call, and we will bring that item before council. Um, and, uh, and so we're, you have one tonight. We're, we have one tonight, Mr. Lauer. Would you care to uh, yes. this is elucidate? Mr. Uh, Ron Books. Uh, <laughs> the idea of a roundabout, a Valley Brook Bebout intersection is not a viable option for the following reasons. A, if the roundabout were to be built, the traffic tie-up would be significant during construction. 
have alternative routes and detours been studied? I'd love to see them. B, approximately 50% of the, the traffic traveling south on Bebout Road turns right onto Valley Brook, while the other 50% of the traffic traveling east on Valley Brook Road turns right onto Bebout. A simple solution to save 50% of the traffic backup at this intersection is to invest in turnout lanes. C, uh, it is evident, at least to me, the lack of brainstorming regarding this issue has led to conclusions that are suboptimum. Government shines brightest in the process it does best, failing. And for those watching at home on TV, let it be understood that wasn't our conclusion, it was PennDOT's conclusion. Oh, there, as I have expressed to you before, what PennDOT has made perfectly clear to us is, if there is to be an intersection improvement project, the only, the only form that will be acceptable in that intersection is roundabout. Do you have that simulation that, that you sh they showed us? Um, I, do, I do not have it. I could get that. I could tell you this. It would um, be a good thing to have posted on our website. Yeah. I, I, you know, at the, one of the things that is included in, in the docket, and I think that's what caused, uh, piqued Mr. Books' interest, is that we had a scoping meeting with them. And one of the things that they have done with regard to that to that intersection is to actually, if you're coming from the, the rec center underneath the trail, they have pushed, and when, when they originally laid out the roundabout, they dropped it right in the middle of that intersection. They have pushed it up and over to the left. So it's in that vac it's more in that vacant piece of property. And when you see that, um, and that may not be its final design, but when you see that preliminary design, that is going to work so much better than trying to drop that circle, you know, right into the intersection. So I think they're trying to be thoughtful about it. Um, what, what they told us in that scoping meeting is that that project and the project that um, Bebout and East McMurray Road are both going to occur in 2023. Um, the other thing that... Excuse me, and hopefully in a staggered construction... I, I have no idea. Um, there's two different engineers working on them, so I don't know to what extent they'll be coordinated. The, the other thing, though, that was interesting is um, the summary that they handed out indicated that the funding sources were 100% state of Pennsylvania, 100% federal, and there, there, was, there was no local match. And this pro these two projects have been, uh, been predicated for quite some time on a significant contribution by the township, but there's no mention of that in their, their current. Don't expect that to stand still, though. The, the, well, I don't the know, Commonwealth I tell is going to be broke. I did not raise my hand and say, where's the money you asked us for? So. But yeah, we'll but I, and I'd also like to comment that uh, he, he mentions that, you know, that the lack of uh, brainstorming regarding the issue, uh, I can assure everybody that there was a significant amount of discussion that went on with this council regarding options for that intersection. Um, we discussed and we discussed and we discussed. So. This, well, did, this didn't happen in a void. Not a choice. Yeah, well, no. the other thing that I explained to PennDOT and, and to their engineers were that I, I think there's lots of opinions with regard to this, and one of the things that's always incorporated into their process is public input, and I told them that they need to be prepared to host meetings because I do think there'll be a lot of people who have a, an opinion one way or the other with regard to that. What is the timeline for something like that? I was trying to remember how far in advance they normally do that. The, I, my guess is that sometime next year that they would be in a position to, to be able to do something like that. Does Ron's traffic study match with uh, PennDOT S? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether his traffic counts. But it's 50 percent. It just seems like such a nice round number to me. You have to understand, Mr. And in my humble opinion, as a non-transportation engineer, I feel that that is still a questionable solution to that intersection for a variety of reasons. And there are people who feel the same. And many of the people who feel that way are the ones who travel through there all the time. So I think if, if the state has their open meetings, that they can get input, they can demonstrate the brainstorming and the calculations and the little 
design that showed the cars whizzing around the circle and let people yeah, I can assure everybody that there will be significantly more discussion about this. Mm -hmm. so, okay, um, any unfinished business? None. New, new business request for departure for the uh, typical paving standard is shown on the approved plan for Jupiter Woods. So uh, the first three items on the agenda all relate to Jupiter Woods. The first has to do with um, uh, the paving standard. Just to refresh people's memory, um, the Juniper Wood site is being developed off of uh, Thompsonville Road, um, uh, and this kind of encompasses uh, that area. It's bordered by Thompsonville Road. It, it uh, uh, abuts uh, Manor Way, and of course, uh, as we'll discuss later, there are a number of roads, Manor Way, Beacon Way, uh, Locust Drive, Franklin, all of which are township roads that right now cannot be uh, access unless you go uh, up to Hayes Road and, and go through um, Upper St. Clair. So, um, you know, this is the uh, plan and uh, at this point um, it is a, uh, the grading and the roadway has been put in uh, across about half of the property. The, this zoning district calls for a 20-foot roadway and a three to five foot planting strip and then a five foot for sidewalks and what what is and, and if you look at the approved drawings the typical road section is in fact for a 20 foot roadway and i can't tell you why and i don't i don't have a no one's been able to give me a good explanation but for some reason when the roadway itself was put in the roadway was put in at 24 feet so there's actually two additional feet of asphalt in, on either side of either side of the road. So the question tonight is what to do when the remaining portion of of the roadway gets paved. And um, uh, Mr. Welsh, uh, in a letter requesting um, some relief and direction, has suggested, and I think he's right. There's probably three viable alternatives. One is to continue to pave it at 24 feet. Um, and I, I, I think Mr. Welsh's preference is not to do that because there's a considerable expense to doing that. The other would be to taper the road down to 20 feet or a third alternative, and I actually believe this to be the, the, the better alternative, is to taper it down to 22 feet so it isn't so dramatic. This, you know, when you're going through the plane, you don't suddenly see this taper in um, dramatically down to 20 feet. Um, yeah, you know, it's also going to taper in the sidewalks and the, and the, the grassy portion, too. Well, yeah. no, but here's what, I, what, what, what Ed, uh, Ed Zook and I had talked about is that the sidewalks aren't in yet in the first part. So what we need to do is to move the sidewalks throughout the entire plan so that they're three foot off the road. And that way, they'll taper in with the road and it won't it will look right. It won't look as though, um, it, it won't look, you won't have a wider grass strip in some sections and a narrower grass strip in others. Well, excuse me, though, though, that strip can be between three and five feet. Yes. So you're saying to standardize the whole thing at three feet, even at the parts where the road yeah. then becomes 20? Yeah, well, it becomes 22, and yes, to keep it three, to keep, the sidewalk and the cartway, that strip three foot wide throughout. So it looks like it was designed that way, as opposed to you get into the middle of the sidewalk and suddenly I'm, it I'm sorry, with, with Monica, is the planting strip still gonna be three and a half feet? It's gonna be three feet. Three feet. Yes. Yes. And the sidewalk five. Yes. And the one thing that oh, oh, uh, Mark and I both believe makes sense is to to start that transition at the beginning of these open spaces. So it may be that there's this small piece of asphalt that comes out here and a small piece here, but that taper occurs at the point of the open space as opposed to occurring uh, in front of people's homes. So, Well, if I'm not mistaken, the idea of the 20-foot roadway is to, it serves as a traffic calming yes. measure unto itself because yes. it's narrower than 
a regular street. So now we're not going to have the traffic calming measure that we wanted. Well, you're going to have it on the back end. You're going to have it somewhere yeah, on the part that's going to get. So people will fly up. like. They'll fly up that to, out of to the taper. But it'll be well, it'll still be well, the part coming down from Manor Way, which is the part that all the people who live up in that neighborhood were concerned about when they came to that meeting when we had to review the preliminary plan. That part's still going to have it's going to have what we were. This is going to be a narrow road right. down here. And then the other thing is there are other traffic calming elements inside of this plan. So there are uh, places, and Mark probably knows these better than me, uh, where there are raised um, uh, crosswalks. Sure but the connection from Manor Way is going to be 22 feet then? 20. 20. This okay. is going to be 20. Because right. this road couldn't be wider than 20. Yeah. Right. So, so the location where you're suggesting the paper then, that's, there's a raised intersection there as well? There is a raised Raised and crosswalks. Where is that at? Is it here? Uh, left, here, there, right there, up top, right here. We might have to adjust those. Yeah. yeah. But we're you can adjust those based upon what we're doing. Okay, so, so that would be where the taper is. Yeah. So my thought is if, if we have the elevated crosswalks there, I'm not sure it's really going to stand out that much if, if we even if we do taper to the 20 foot. Yeah, that's what I. I, 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 I excuse my ignorance. Why, why can't we go from the. 24 to the taper to 20. Oh, you can. I, I do think it's going to stand up because I think you're talking about uh, I mean, that's two feet on either side. That's four feet. Over 75 feet, that's not long. I would rather see them all at the same 24 foot uniform throughout the whole belt. Yeah, except then the whole development's wrong. The whole development would not meet conservation right. mm -hmm. criteria, but I would tell you that the residents would probably like it better. Because the 20-foot width roads are very yeah, narrow. Well, the side so would everyone who wants to drive faster, they'd love the wide I'll go to 22. I, what, what, what span are you proposing tapering this over, Paul? 75 feet. Which is one property width? Yeah, which is about one property width. And again, that's why if I were doing this, I would do it starting here so that the tapers are occurring not in front of a house. That makes sense. Okay. Is that going to screw up the setbacks for houses? No. No, no the right way still stays the same. Okay. And there are still sidewalks on the sides of the road. Right. But now the planting strip is going to be the minimum. It's three going to be feet. three feet. Not so, yeah. five, not four or five. Yeah. Can I ask the chief, are we, did we make a mistake thinking that, ah, uh, uh, 20-foot road with somebody parked in the street is still passable with fire equipment? I raised that issue. It didn't go anywhere. They're not supposed to be parking in the street. Well, you can't park in the street during daylight hours. During daylight hours, you can't? You can't. Can. Right. Yeah. Remember, I asked about whether there was going to be areas for off-street parking. For guest parking? Like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the answer to that was no. So what does council All right, do? Well, I'll make a motion that uh, we allow the developer to taper the roadway from 24 feet to 22 feet over a 75 foot span as selected by Mr. Lauer. Sure. Mr. Zavidas <laughs> as well. I'll second that motion. Okay, other discussion? Is, is the drawing going to be subject to anybody's review? Or like let it do. It's going to be subject to the review of the township engineer. Okay. So. As long as that's that part of your motion, Jeff, right? It, it sure is. Okay, thank you. I thought I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, any other discussion? In are favor? We, are we going to require the recording of an amended subdivision plan or something to show this? Doesn't have to. Yeah, I guess I don't know that you need to do All that. Because right. the, the only thing that's really important that, as far as I'm concerned in the subdivision plan is the designation of the right of way, and the right of way is not changing. All right. Thank you. All right. In favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Before we move off this, I just have a question about the role the gateway engineer steps in this plan. If I understand it correctly, they're out there doing inspections on all the back, correct? 
That's correct, and and, and, and as I as state in my um, in my report, this this error wasn't caught by the developer, wasn't caught by the developer's engineer, wasn't caught by the paving contractor, and it wasn't caught by Gateway Engineers, who was our inspector. And when we brought this issue up with Gateway Engineers, the explanation that the inspector gave. Um, to the to our representative was I didn't think it was a problem because you were getting more than what was asked for <laughs> and I don't know how he, anybody comes to that conclusion that that's just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Is he out there daily? He's not out there he, he you know don't, I don't know I, I would assume when when there's paving going on he would be out there I would assume daily but but it, you know when they're doing laying this out he's not out there every day while they're there but there's no reason, given everybody involved in this, how this occurred. I, I don't get that. Beautiful. Well, yeah, I, I'm just, I don't like the fact that they're working on our behalf and jumping. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Just one point. This was the fifth plan that we... Ed, could you come up to the, because I can't hear it. The first four plans, which was Brookwood Village, Brookwood Place, Just About Farms, and Hamlet 6, all were approved with the 20-foot narrower cartway, all got built correctly. They were all up, inspected by Gateway Engineers? Correct. So that what happened here, don't well, no. Didn't we don't want that inspector anymore? Um, yeah. But I don't even know if that, I, I'd have to find out who that inspector was. And I, 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 mean, I think there should be some financial errors. Okay, except what are our damages? Well, then, uh, well, we paid yeah, it for something they didn't do. Well, the cost is going to ignore to Mr. Welch. Right, that's what I mean. Yes. Passed on. We probably could have got a cheaper bid if everybody knew it was 20 foot instead of 20 yeah, foot. But I will, I will tell you this I think Mr. Welsh is also <laughs> responsible for this, too. It's his project, it's his engineers that are laying it out, it's his paver. And so I think there's lots of blame to go all around uh, with regard to this. Uh, okay. okay. Um, next item is a request for a departure from regulations regarding the release of funds posted for the guarantee of construction of public improvements. So um, I don't know. Do you, do you want to explain what your request is here? <coughs> what well, is we're going to hold 5%. We're going to hold 5% out of 10. And, and, I can, and the engineer gave us a report saying that if we do that, there's still sufficient money, yes. in their yes. opinion, yes. To, to, to complete the project, right? right? I yes. hope it wasn't prepared by the guy that did the no. inspection. <laughs> um, prepared by Mr. Russ Meisel. We have faith in Mr. Russ Meisel. Okay. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. We'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve it. I'll second. Any other discussion? Favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Good presentation, Woody. Thanks, way, way to go. I like that. Short, sweet, to the point. Acquisition of right of way needed to extend Manor Way. So, as Council's aware, when this plan was uh, originally designed, uh, one of the things that we were interested in is extending out to Manor Way so that, in fact, we could get access uh, to Township Roads that currently we need to access through Upper St. Clair. Um, the other thing that I would remind you of is that there was a question as to what our ownership rights were with regard to Manor Way. The recorded um, right of way is actually uh, in the middle of a creek. The road was never built there in the 1950s. These were private streets that the township took over, and um, the uh, uh, we have maintained manor way for over 21 years in its current location so it is it is mr smith's opinion that uh, not only do we have ownership rights of the right of way um, uh, a 33 foot right of way along the existing manor way that we in fact have no ownership rights over where the original right of way was was um, located since we did nothing uh, to uh, place a road in that location. And I read that memo, Mr. Lauer, and I think it's absolutely on point. I, I would have written it exactly the same had I been asked to write it. So uh, 
I'll make a motion that we authorize the township manager to commence eminent domain proceedings to acquire the .035 acres of land needed to extend Manor Way into the Juniper Woods plan of lots. Second. Are there discussion? I, I do have a question regarding that. Given the amount of money that we offered to the gentleman, plus the addition of the other piece of property, which using the same calculations would be valued at 10000 if we commence eminent domain, what's our expense? Well, that's what I mean, I would like to know what we're potentially in for, and is there a way, not that I want to keep bargaining with him, but is there is there a number that we need to get to for this gentleman, or I'd, I'd like to know the alternative before we move I, I don't think in the case of Mr. Snyder, it's a question of money, it's a question of the the connection and um, what, what my intention is, is I've talked to uh, Mr. Smith about this um, to find out whether or not what we're talking about is 0.035 acres we're talking about a very uh, small sliver of land um, Mr. Smith is going to talk to Mr. Bresnahan to find out whether or not they can work together and do it in a way that keeps the cost down so what I intend to do is to come back to council and let you know exactly the process we, that we intend to use. I think the thing that's unfortunate here is that, um, and I think Mrs. Merrill is correct on this, to be able to do this, we're gonna have to get two appraisals, and then we're gonna have to employ the services of, uh, of an attorney. And those costs, I don't think will be exorbitant, but they, there will be a cost there. Um, and um, quite frankly, I would rather give that money to Mr. Snyder rather than to spend it on attorneys. But quite, the other side of it is, I don't think Mr. Snyder is interested in negotiating this. Well, this you've point, been so. talking with him for more than two years now, haven't you? Yes, well, and um, I just recently talked to him, and he made it quite clear that if you want the piece of land, you're going to have to sue us. Um, Mr. Smith has contacted his attorney to, to, to make sure he has a new attorney to make sure he's up to date on uh, Mr. Smith's opinion. He has that. He's talked to his client. Uh, and got back to uh, Mr. Smith and indicated that, in fact, what I, my sense of this is, is correct. So well, I mean, then he's not leaving us any choice. Then I think we made it clear when we when that plan came in. The, I mean, that we need to have that connection. So okay. what choice I, I we guess, have? I guess my question is whether or not the gentleman understands that the offer you we've made five thousand mm dollars -hmm. for that piece of that amount of acreage. If you do the multiplication, it's almost $143,000 an acre. I, yeah, Plus, we're giving that. him other property. That's a very fair offer. Okay. Why well, explain that? And what? even if it goes to court, I mean, what would be your recommendation as a, as, if, as a judge? I mean, do you really think that offer's a bad offer? That, oh, I mean, I think he's potentially going to spend more money and, not, and get less in the end. Yeah, oh, there's no question. Doesn't he have a claim for fees in the condemnation? Four thousand dollars, right? Maximum for right, yeah, maxed out four thousand. So, you know, I mean, how much did we offer him? Five, and he's just not interested at all. When we offer that point oh three five sliver of ground, and when, we're giving him and and, seven and, of an acre. and Mr. Welsh has agreed to give him back twice that amount of land to square up his property line. Is he still offering to give him that land now? I think he is, but I think if it goes to condemnation, then I don't think that's going to occur because I don't think it's a way inside the condemnation so process. Whole, just that little, are we going to file just for that sliver, or are we going to file for the whole thing? So no, we own the other. I mean, John's concluded that we own yes. the other piece because we've used it for more than 21 years. Yes. So, I mean, that's... No, like I mean, that, that, he hate to sue township citizens, but... Township residents, excuse me. No, it's been, it's been, we've tried, we've done our best, yeah, we've we made a very reasonable offer. Down the road pretty it's, it, you know, it's been made clear to them that we're going to get it one way or the other. Either he sells it to us or we're going to take it, so. Okay. I mean, well, okay. like I said, it's coming back to you because we'll have more information exactly on cost and things like that in the process we're going to use. So we don't have to do a motion then? No. All right. Okay. All right. Um, then I will withdraw the motion I made. That's what, that was my prompt. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so no action required. Uh, 
Next item is a request from Union Township to share the cost of a storm sewer improvement project. So you have in your docket a letter from Union Township asking for the uh, Peters Township to resolve what they perceive to be a stormwater issue um, affecting Union Township. Now, um, this is Shirt Camp Road. This is track, this is Turkey Foot Road that connects on the change his name to Tracks Road here. We believe this to be the township line. There is a catch basin on the road that is located here that drains in this direction. Um, we may well have installed this. I'm not sure of that. There is a private pipe that is a uh, corrugated metal pipe that's completely rusted up that was placed in here. We assume by, by Tracks Farm, uh, it drains down onto here and there's an icing problem that occurs in here. So what Union Township is requesting is that we replace this private sewer line, that we extend the sewer line back this direction and drain it into this creek, at the same time placing multiple catch basins along this road. My point- Why wouldn't we just go straight across and go right into the creek? Uh, well, because uh, I, I think tracks doesn't want that to occur, but irregardless, I, if this was, I think where the property, the township line is, is really irrelevant because even if this were in Peters Township, as they assume it is, if we had a resident who had a, a private line, we would not go in and replace a private sewer line. So that we would never do this work. Um, so if that line's to be replaced, it needs to be replaced by tracks or by Union Township. And having said that, this isn't the best solution. Um, you know, Mark and I have looked at this and we think what actually has happened there is that at one point in time there was a ditch line that allowed the water to drain this direction. That's gone. And uh, so I think there's a better way to do this. So what I'd like to be able to say to Union Township is if you want to be a, want a partner to help you solve this problem, we're willing to partner with you, but we're not willing to go in and do things that we wouldn't do for our own residents. So we think that you could get a ditch to drain this back this way. And even if you were to install storm sewers, we should be working, uh, doing this whole project. That doesn't make sense. Do we have a right of way there when it ditches? Is that within our right of way? Yes. Yeah. So is that something you would have on a public works guys? Yeah, I, think, I, I would assume the public works part would be Well, I would agree that it's not totally the Peter's problem for a number of reasons, one of which being the question about the line, but second, the private property issue, because you're right, why would we do anything more for them than we would do for our own residents? Mm -hmm. So I would agree that we could pay partial, you know, we could try to work with them in some way if we could come to a good solution that would keep the cost down and solve the problem. Yeah. Okay. Is that catch basin up, up further? Does it connect to the catch basin that you're talking about? This catch basin here, and then it, there is a up further up Sugar Camp. Oh, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Huh? Do you know more? No, no, this this just goes across it's here. It's just a single catch basin. Yeah. Is that the one that's kind of dropping in? Um, there's several along there, three or four along the one to Sugar Camp. I'm not sure what it is. Well, it's the one above the terrain. They, they just go cross pipes for the whole this whole length. They're they're not connected this way. They're only going across the road. Mark and Paul, are you aware that he uses this as an access into this area for a parking lot? You're talking about a ditch option across there that might not lend itself to. Uh, well, we run the ditch and put a. Yeah, a culvert pipe in, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be pretty cheap. Okay. I think, I think, the, I think Union Townships picked the, the most expensive way to do this and asked us to do it. Huh. What are they going to pay? The, what they're suggesting is that we've caused this problem and we need to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> nice thought. <laughs> Do you need a motion or do you? No, but there's a consensus of council. I think we know how to move forward. Yeah. We'll talk to their, their project manager for this project. And okay. Do it that way. 
All right, next item is a resolution revising the township's existing stop sign policy. Yes, as council, you gotta go to the microphone, they won't hear you. As Council's aware, uh, we've been working to revise our policies. Um, last August, we revised our oldest policy, which is our winter road, uh, winter storm road maintenance policy. Uh, the last two that are before you tonight are our second and third oldest policies. Uh, the uh, stop sign policy that we had was adopted in July 8th, 1993. Um, it's definitely appropriate for its time, but uh, it does not really comply with current standards or current practices. The policy that's before you tonight was a collaborative effort between myself, Mr. Zook, and Mr. Zemitis. Um, it updates the policy to both state and federal highway standards and roadway standards for installing stop signs. Uh, it adds the um, component of an engineer's uh, determination, which is a pretty vital component in how we look at anything that really doesn't 100% conform to um, stop sign installation, but may still be a viable reason to install a stop sign. Um, and <clears throat> defines the role of the township uh, traffic engineer, uh, creates a defined process for residents to offer input on where stop signs are installed, and also codifies the uh, annual updating of the code of ordinances that Mr. Zemitis does at the end of each year for where we install stop signs. Um, Finally, I, the last thing I'd say, yeah, anytime we take over a private road, this policy incorporates um, the installation of stop signs on that road should, should that situation warrant it. So that's the policy that's before you. If there's any questions, here to answer them. Move we adopt resolution 040220 revising Peters Township's stop sign policy. Second. There's May I have a couple comments? Sure. Um, I don't know if it needs to fit into your policy, but I strongly believe that the vertical strip, reflective strip on a stop sign mm -hmm. is a very effective way to bring attention to the fact that there's one there. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed that up on Bebout, we don't have those strips. And I'm thinking in terms of, is there a way in this to insert the requirement where either on a collector road that we're putting a stop sign on or one that has some limited sight distance or even vegetation? Actually, the intent is um, you know, as we're going through replacing street signs and um, uh, traffic control signs, all, all stop signs will have that strip. They did a lot of up on Abington. Yeah. And so yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's in a plan or on a, a, a collector road, they're going to have those strips because we agree with you, those strips make a big difference. Okay. Uh, Ryan, could yeah. I just clarify with this group who would be meeting annually? Would that be then, you would come to council with a list of where the proposed stop signs would be installed? That's actually in the street light. There's a group in the street light policy. There is, um, I don't believe there's any group here in the uh, stop sign policy. No, there is not. That's the street lights has uh, the annual street, the street light committee that meets on an annual but basis. You're talking about collaborating, so I guess what my question yeah. was is so at some point in time, Alyssa would come to council and this is where we want to put them in, or is that going to be through the course of the year? No, it, the list has to come to council for approval because that becoming part of our code of ordinances is the only way our police can actually enforce it, the, the actual stop sign. And the vast, at the end of the year, you add the ones that yes. we yeah. put in. It's but just right. to update the record. Yeah. And the new stop signs, for the most part, Peter's Township, are all stop signs that have been placed as a result of new plans being done. Right. So once a year, we, we, um, we Mark puts together a list of, of all those stop signs and then we amend yeah. the uh, ordinance. Okay, anything else? Yeah, okay. we're back. Uh, motion? So we're we, we, motion. Yeah. we had a motion. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not going to be able to stop the California's rolling stop. It's yeah. infamous. Yeah. Okay, uh, next item is a resolution revising uh, the township's existing streetlight policy. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll answer this question in advance since I know it's coming. There are 77 streetlights in Peters Township right now. <laughs> Um, the average cost to the township of a street light in terms of uh, power and electricity is $103. So 
just we'll, we'll start there. Um, the current streetlight policy was adopted at some point in the 90s. I actually couldn't find exactly when it was adopted. Uh, actually, I think it's actually before the 90s because I don't ever remember this not being okay. Involved. Okay. You said 100 some dollars a, a month or a year? A year. That's a the year. annual cost for electricity. The LEDs have really lowered the cost of electricity wow. on these stock on these street lights. Um, it established criteria for evaluating where to install street lights, uh, depending on roadway classifications. But it relied heavily on citizen input um, to sort of facilitate the process for a street light being installed. We wanted to adopt a policy that, that was a bit more proactive. That that had the townships. Um, public safety and public works officials looking, you know, they travel the roads routinely, they know where we, we have problems, and try to get them involved in the process while still allowing an avenue for residents to be involved as well. Um, Mrs. Merrill, as you mentioned, this, this policy establishes the Street Light Committee. Uh, there's to meet uh, every year before the end of April, starting this year. Um, establishes a goal of the township installing two street lights annually uh, in order to address problems. Uh, a step from a list established by the Streetlight Committee of troubled intersections or locations of roadway. Uh, to answer another question in advance, cost to install a streetlight at the most, if we have to put in a new pole, is around $2,000. If we're going off existing poles, it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $700 to $1,200. Um, this establishes criteria beyond roadway classification alone that, uh, for why streetlights should be installed in various locations. Um, it incorporates the uh, criteria for considering streetlight installation into the planning department's review of new, de new residential developments um, and establishes standards for uh, township streetlights at primary points of ingress and egress at new uh, residential Does developments that mean as well. planning could require the developer to put the light in? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. And it just uh, the last thing I'd say, it incorporates the township's current LED standards um, for street lights into our policy. The, the old one had the uh, sodium um, lights incorporated into it. So that's the policy that's before you. I'll feel free to. And uh, just one last thing. Uh, this is, again, this, these policies are all a collaborative effort. Uh, Mr. Zook, Mr. Zemitis, Mr. McLa uh, Chief McLaughlin, Chief Grimes, Mr. Herson all played a big part in formulating this policy. <laughs> We adopt resolution 040320 revising the Peters Township Street Lighting Policy. Second. Discussion? Um, I would like to comment that I appreciate that you did this. I think that the idea of adding a street light at the entrance to a new development mm -hmm. makes some sense. Um, I, I don't want to ever do street lights because part of the whole idea of this being a rural community is that you don't have them. Mm -hmm. You have as many. But at an entrance to a development, I think. That's a significant place where yeah. we can see it. You could have spotlights, like some of those are, that are nice. Mm -hmm. They look okay too. Uh, and but one of the, the problem is only 77. If I understand it correctly, they started building the 5G towers uh, in areas where they can attach them to street lights will be fine. Where areas like ours were not, someone's going to end up with a 5G tower in their front yard. So. We're working, on a, we're working on the zoning amendment for that right now with the Cohen Law Group. Okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, real quick, uh, Mrs. Merrill, just to, to get to your point, um, one of the considerations obviously in there is light pollution and the impact of glare or other things on residents in terms of where street lights are placed. So that, that is a consideration both planning and the street light committee will look at. Sorry. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, ordinance amending uh, Peter Township Code of Ordinances, Chapter 17, Boards and Commissions, Article 4, Youth Commission. Uh, Ryan could have done this one too because he's the one who worked on this. Um, the, the Youth Commission and Chief Grimes uh, want, uh, wanted first to update the ordinance that, that uh, created the Youth Commission to reflect um, the, the way the, the commission currently operates and also to make reference appropriately to the police chief as opposed to a public service director that doesn't, doesn't exist. So uh, in this ordinance, it, it affirms that directors and uh, staff of youth serving agencies um, who don't uh, provide services in Peters Township but do that elsewhere are allowed to serve on the commission. They have to be residents, correct? They have to be residents, but right now, you know, 
I've always taken the position when you read the existing ordinance that this was possible. This just simply clarifies that if you're, if you're a, um, a, uh, a minister in another community, you can serve on, on this committee because you're not dealing with uh, local uh, children. Um, it um, requires the commission members be sworn in at the Washington County Court System before they participate in the meeting. Um, it establishes a requirement for annual training. Um, it clarifies the criteria for appearances by participating youth. Um, it establishes criteria by which the youth commission can de decline cases. They have, um, they've always had discretion about uh, being able to de decline cases, but it establishes clear criteria that they can use. Um, it establishes the rules for determining what, what constitutes a quorum. The fact of the matter is they, they uh, you know, there's a small group of people who work with a group of children, and so um, it isn't necessary that, that, that every member of that board be there to be able to do that. And like I said, it changes the reference from the police chief, from the public safety director to the police chief. So it's my recommendation that uh, council amend chapter 17 of the, of the code of ordinances. So I'll make a motion that we adopt ordinance 851 amending the Pierce Township Code of Ordinances, chapter 17, boards and commissions, article four, youth commission. I'll second. Is there a discussion? I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, does this require the people that serve on those, on the commission, to have all the, you know, the state child clearances and all yes. that? And and secondly, um, how many people go through this program roughly in a year? Um, you know, it varies on the year, but there's there's normally simply a few kids every you know a couple of months that are doing this. It is it, you know, there aren't a tremendous volume of kids who go through this program, but, but it seems to run in cycles. Okay. Um, I just thought it was a, a lot of work for a handful of people. But. Well, I think it's a good alternative, and I think you're right. It's probably not a ton of kids, but the ones who are served yes. by it, it's probably a great alternative. Yes. If, if I could just share, I did send Chief Grimes a number of questions about this, and it sounds to me, his explanation was very thorough and detailed and it sounds to me that right now there are a lot of guidelines but he's trying to make sure that the details about how this works because of the confidentiality and the type of work they do is really um, documented and the training is being developed by them there is no actual youth commission training um, and I, I just wanted to recognize him and connect him and the board members on the commission who are working on that okay Alrighty. Uh, motion and second. Motion and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, authorization to install a pollinator garden at Elm Grove Park. So this is actually an initiative that's coming out of the Environmental Quality Board. Um, what they would like to do is uh, participate in Project Wingspan, which is intended to create pollinator gardens um, to, to um, uh, increase monarch and rusty patched uh, bumblebee uh, environment. Uh, where they'd like to put this is at Elm Grove Park. If you go to Elm Grove Park above the field, there is this area that we currently mow, but it's really not, it's, it sits on a slope. It isn't really uh, suitable uh, for anything. Um, I think this is this is a win-win. I think uh, we provide, you know, this this habitat for for these butterflies, and at the same time, what it does is it removes our obligation to be main, to mowing this. This is going on forever. Yes, pollinator gardens can go on forever. They're normally planted with perennials. And does the school district have to consent to this? Since you know, technically, don't we get that from? Them? Well. Could we get it for a dollar or we have to give it back if they want it or something? Yes, it's something like that. And, and quite honestly, I don't think there's any commitment on, on the part. There's no contract or, or lease that we're entering into with this group. So if, in fact, at some point in the future, the school district decides that they need this back and they're going to plow that under, I don't think that's, that's the end of the world. I, I, I think it's a very commendable thing, so I'm going to make a motion that 
Uh, we permit the fish to be granted to the Peters Township Environmental Quality Board to develop the pollinator garden in uh, Oak Elm Grove Park um, as part of this project wingspan that's more fully delineated in, in the record, in the docket. Second. Discussion? I have one question. Who's actually going to be planting this? It's actually a group of volunteers that are uh, coordinated by um, um, Cal U. Cal U, yeah. yeah. Well, and from what you wrote in the docket, it seems as if there's no cost to us and actually will be a savings mm -hmm. for Public Works time. Right. And if they want to put another one, I'd be okay with that. Too. I was going to say, I, I, I think you have enough few hillsides in the township where they could do this. Yeah. There could be a lot. Yeah. I, I want to see what, how well, it is we perform. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do I, I just envision this as being a wildflower garden. That's what it is, okay. a wildflower garden. Yeah. You know, you have a small pollinator garden that actually sits on the edge of the uh, library right now, and it's, it's some planted with perennials, and, and I know it's a pollinator garden, but I think if you looked at it, you would just see a bunch of flowers. So. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ready, payroll and bills. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I reviewed the pay statement in the cons table last Thursday. This payroll um, of about 279000 represents the last pay cycle when people were still fully employed here prior to the layoffs. Um, in the bills, the items of note include a lot of checks for refunds on uh, park shelters and programs. And then a, an additional amount for AEC because they had to set up remote working. Um, I reviewed the bills and recommend that we pay them as presented. I'll second. Okay, uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, correspondence, anything you need to uh, talk about, Mr. Lauer? Well, the, the only one that I would point out to council is that you have a letter from a uh, Mr. McKinney uh, who would like uh, someone from council to contact them. He's interested in serving uh, in a, um, a elected uh, official's position and he would like to develop an understanding of what, what that's about, so. It's an elected official position? Mm-hmm. All right, would you give me his contact information? I will. Okay. He used to come here. He used to cover meetings. Yes, he did. For, uh, I don't think it was JPA. I uh, w, yep, JPA. Yeah. So who was it? Then? And he was doing some kind of uh, announcing down in Waynesburg yeah. or something, yeah. I think. He was, uh, I'd be right. happy to talk with him also. Okay. Well, and I, I can get everybody a copy of this, but I can tell you this is in your docket. Uh, so, but I'll get everybody okay. a copy of this as well. All righty. Um, reports. Anybody need to talk about anything in the reports? I, didn't, I, I think the fire report was admitted. They, uh, I have it. It wasn't admitted. I did not have it in time. <laughs> I think can Chief, we go yes, we can. I think Chief Mike's been busy. Um, I did have a, just a comment about the engineering. Um, for anyone who's listening, we do have the HOP for Rolling Hills, which is really great. Um, at this point now, do we have Washington County's approval? Because when this came out, that was last week. We do not. Uh, yeah. the, uh, Final iteration of the plan is in the hands of the government this week. We're, we're hoping by the end of the week, we'll get the course next week. We have a plan that's going to be kind of fun. It's all in that area. Yeah, now the construction's approved. Yeah. That would be great. And Liberati, I mean, they're on notice. They, they can go out and start doing some layout work and some tree clearing and stuff. It's not that doesn't involve our community, so they're starting to kind of quickly, you know, get back into the school district around the town and stuff. Yeah. I'd just like to also make a comment. Now, last week was National Library Week, and um, I'd like to recognize the library staff. I think they're doing a very good job trying to keep the community engaged, different programs and things like that, so I'd just like to recognize them. Park and Rec is also trying to keep things moving with, with people online, so making the best of a bad situation. Okay, uh, miscellaneous. Anybody have anything on miscellaneous? Yeah, I, the situation that occurred, Paul, I called you on Sunday because it was uh, a dangerous situation in front of the Waters Group construction. Mm -hmm. Was that just because the 
the storm drain got clogged or? Yes, um, we had notified uh, PennDOT of that uh, last week. They had failed to get out there. So um, when you had given me a call, I had Joe go out uh, with the guys. And, well, that, and that whole stretch now along Valley Brook seems to continue to have areas where water is forming, like near, uh, What's the insurance? Uh, NSS. NSS. Yeah. Well, that's bad. Yeah. I noticed that. It's you know where the guy's house is. Yeah. Uh, that's always bad. Yeah. And we talked about that Ed, a couple months ago. And Pendon hasn't done anything about that. And then a little further on, there's another area where the catch water isn't draining to the catch basin. Yeah. So what can we what can we do well, to get Pendon? Yeah. And Sugar Camp was a disaster too. The, the only thing that we can do is to continue to petition and well, not do that work, and it, and it does not work well. Oh, Mark, one sugar camp, is there a collapsed pipe there? It looks like there's an inlet there. Yeah, in the front of horse farm there. Yeah, yeah. no, it's yeah. inside of the road. Yeah, the, the problem is they don't have cooperation. Yeah, there's a lot of you know. We, you know, Penn used to have a call to the inner of the road, just come down from the horse farm okay. property, you know, that stream. At some point, the, Long past that stream was enclosed by the property owner. So now PennDOT's claiming they don't have access to the water into their pipes so they can't get jet it out. So their plan that they've been telling us for the last several years is that they're going to go to the right of way line, dig it up, put a manhole so they have access so they can jet their pipe out and get everything free flowing again. It's going to be there. Yeah. It's probably been three years. I have one other issue. I got an email the past two Sundays from a resident on Thompsonville around the area of the, uh, uh, toward the top, McMurray. The dumpster being picked up at the, the BP there. Oh, we, we've, been, we've been on that. So, <laughs> um, I don't know how many dumpsters they have. He sent me emails twice yesterday. That there were two but, times that there was a pickup. So yesterday? Morning, uh, yes, on the, okay. Yeah, that was the issue, was that there are Sunday morning pickups. Yeah, the, 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 me video of yeah the, the issue before was that they were picking him up at uh, 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and we got that taken care of. Let me once again try to educate the things. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I have two things under miscellaneous. Um, I, I really did appreciate the information about Youth Commission Ordinance. And when I was looking on the ordinances, I, I realized that there's a lot of inconsistency about how all the board boards are portrayed. There's no standardization as to how they're described or what the requirements are. And I was hoping um, that perhaps that could be something that would be a goal uh, this year coming up where things could be looked at and we could standardize that along with a review of the boards in particular. We've talked in the past about attendance and some of the criteria, and I just think that's a worthwhile um, endeavor for us to take a look at. So I would like to perhaps put that on your goals, Mr. Lauer. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I wanted to share is some sad news that um, Laura Norton shared with me that Peter's Pantry, the food pantry at Peace Lutheran, is being closed permanently. Um, given the COVID situation, plus the fact of the turnover of administration, um, they've been partnering with Washington County to do the distribution, so they're going to make that a permanent situation for the time being. Uh, so that'll be closed immediately. They're going to pull all of their supplies and send all their donations of cash and supplies to the Washington County Food Bank. And if anyone wants to support them, they need to direct donations to the Washington County. So I just I wanted to share that. There will be other announcements coming out, but I wanted to recognize Laura and all the volunteers who've done so much to keep that going over the years. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, just thank Tom for putting Chrome on my uh, on the laptop. It makes it easier to access Google Maps when we have different things. So, Tom, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, next agenda items. Mr. Lord, what is the ETA on the side ordinance? Um, we had an opportunity um, to sit down and talk about that uh, uh, last week. Um, uh, the the changes that I was recommending, uh, I think, are going to be incorporated. I would hope by the end of this week, and so therefore ready to circulate. 
Um, Ed's already reached out to the chamber to let them know that this is coming. So uh, they're interested in helping us disseminate that information to the, to the business community. So we'll probably see it in one of the next two meetings. Well, here's the problem, and we, you know, one of the ordinances that we were going to um, enact um, or bring to a public hearing was the fee ordinance, but it requires that, that there be a public hearing. You know, the signed ordinance will require that there be uh, a public hearing, and I don't know how we're going to do that. I, I haven't figured out how, how we go about doing that. I don't think, quite frankly, the fee ordinance, we pulled it because we wanted to limit people coming in. but. Quite honestly, I don't think you're going to get a lot of comments on the on the V ordinance. The last time we did a signed ordinance, we yeah. packed this place. And 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 I, I'll be honest with you, the changes that are in the signed ordinance are not are not uh, intended uh, to address uh, things inside the commercial districts for the most part. So I don't think there's going to be the interest what that there was the last time. But I'm not going to guarantee you that you won't get people in who are going to want to offer an opinion. So. We need to I, I would. Out how to do that. I would really suggest that we wait for a couple months and see what plays out in our our meeting uh, protocols and see because I I do remember the last couple times we've talked about signed ordinances we've gotten a lot of people here. Yes, and again I think what I would like to do and, and Ed and I are comfortable with this is because the um, the chamber has certainly shown its ability um, to host. Um, successfully host Zoom kind of meetings. And I think we can begin that, that discussion with them using that vehicle. Well, I think that, that we, we can also let them partner with us, if you will, on the discussion process and you know, let, their, let their members have discussion before it gets to here. Mm -hmm. And then by the time it gets to us, they will have hopefully had a chance to uh, work out some of their questions. Yeah. Okay, um, anything else on miscellaneous? Okay, we have an executive session. We do not. Uh, we do not, okay. Oh, I'm disappointed. Okay, uh, lacking that, we are?